Welcome to this video. This series of four short videos looks at various psychological approaches to how children learn and how they affect the way children are taught. When we first start teaching, or if we have mainly taught in one particular kind of teaching situation, it is normal to teach according to how we were taught when we were students or how we were trained as teachers, or how other teachers around us tend to teach. But I think if we are to develop as teachers, we need to look deeply at the assumptions behind these methods, or behind any methods that are considered normal in our particular teaching environment. And I think one of the best ways to do this is to look at alternative psychological approaches to how children learn. Think which approach we tend to agree with most, and then try and teach and generally interact with the children in a way that is consistent with that approach. In these videos, I can't look at every alternative approach or even every aspect of the approaches that I will talk about, but I will give links to where you can find more information. I will focus on a few approaches and on key points related to those approaches that I think it is particularly helpful for teachers of young learners to be aware of. First, let's look at behaviorism. Behaviorism was the dominant paradigm in psychology in the 1950s and 1960s. This is a time when, in many countries, educational systems were being rebuilt and reformed after the Second World War. And behaviorist approaches became ingrained in the classroom. And their influence has stayed with us ever since. For many teachers, behaviorist ways of teaching languages to young learners became a kind of common sense. Educational psychology has moved on since then. There have been at least two significant paradigm shifts since the 1950s. First with what is sometimes called the cognitive revolution, and then with a big shift towards constructivism. But a lot of classroom practice is still rooted in behaviorism. It could also be argued that the development of neuroscience has led to another big shift. And in one sense, of course, that is true. But I think developments in neuroscience so far are generally compatible with constructivism. So what is behaviorism? Well, it focuses on visible behavior, and not so much on emotions or on the reasons behind the behavior. A key element is that behavior can be conditioned. The two most well-known behaviorists are Pavlov and Skinner. And Skinner's focus on conditioning through rewards has had a big influence on the way young learners have been taught ever since. In practical terms, what do teachers of young learners do that has been influenced by behaviorism? The first big influence is that teachers teach. In a behaviorist approach, adults condition children. This leads to a teacher-centered approach. The teacher-centered approach, of course, didn't start with behaviorism. The approach has been dominant in education for a very long time, especially where education has focused on preparation for the military or preparation for industrial society or simply because it was normal in a hierarchical society. It has been challenged historically by many important thinkers, but teacher-centered approaches are still common sense for many teachers. Behaviorist approaches to teaching fitted comfortably into this long tradition of teaching children through a teacher-centered approach. Behaviorist techniques that are common when teaching young learners are repeat after me, drilling, 
or any kind of repetitive pattern practice, and the use of rewards, such as stickers. When a teacher says, repeat after me, or drills the children, it is a kind of conditioning. It focuses on visible behavior, not on the reasons behind the behavior. And it often involves very little emotion. It is clearly behavioristic. The use of extrinsic rewards such as stickers to condition behavior is also behavioristic. Let's look at these rewards a bit more closely. There is now convincing evidence that extrinsic rewards that are expected by children have a negative effect on intrinsic motivation. When a child is intrinsically motivated, she feels that learning itself is meaningful and satisfying. As a result, she is more likely to focus on the process of learning, not just on finishing a task and getting a reward. So she is more likely to develop skills that can be transferred to other situations and more likely to be an autonomous learner. When a child is more extrinsically motivated, she is more focused on the end product rather than on the process of learning. And so she's less likely to develop skills that can be transferred and less likely to be an autonomous learner. Extrinsic rewards may be effective for tasks where short-term accuracy is required, such as when preparing for next week's test, or when memorizing English patterns just before a trip abroad. But if a child comes to depend on extrinsic rewards to motivate her, it will probably weaken her ability to learn in the long term. If we focus on the immediate, visible impact of rewards on getting children to do what we want them to do in class, extrinsic rewards may seem to be effective. But if we want the children to be interested in English away from the class and motivated to study at home, extrinsic rewards are quite likely to have a negative effect. Some of the earliest experiments on this were done with children who liked to draw pictures. When the children were given rewards for drawing, it was found that their interest in drawing decreased. There are also a lot of experiments where large classes of children are divided into two halves. Each half has the same lesson, but one half is taught with rewards and the other has no rewards. After the class finishes, it is found that the children in the class with no rewards are more likely to continue to be interested in the content of the lesson. This is not to say that rewards are always wrong. But I think it is important to be aware of the negative aspects of rewards and to take these into consideration. If we do use rewards, we need to use them in a way that minimizes the possible damage to intrinsic motivation. For example, it is likely that surprise rewards, rather than expected rewards, will not have a negative effect. Research also seems to show that task non-contingent rewards have a less detrimental effect on intrinsic motivation than task contingent rewards. So for example, if the children are playing a language game with points, it is best for them to get points for chance elements in the game, such as throwing a dice, not for English ability. I think behaviorist conditioning is often deceptively effective. Rewards and drilling may produce apparently positive visible results in the short term, but may have a negative effect at a deeper level. If you want your students to be more self-motivated and more likely to go home and be interested in learning English, it is probably not a good idea to use these kinds of methods. Or at least not make them a central part of your lessons. The Blank Slate
Behaviorist teaching methods, and teacher-centered methods in general, are often criticized for treating children like blank slates, who need to be taught in order to learn. In the classroom, this leads to a cause-and-effect approach to the introduction of new knowledge to children. I teach, and so you learn. You learn because I teach. A class may be very active with lots of fun. But new language targets are first introduced clearly by the teacher. Through methods such as repetition, modeling, demonstration, or explanation. All of these methods assume that children learn because teachers teach. If you think that when the baby is born, the baby is like a blank slate, then behaviorist methodology may be appropriate for you. If you don't, then it would be best to seriously question this kind of methodology. There are various alternatives to seeing children as blank slates. One alternative is to see children as being shaped by evolution and having natural potential. Another is to see a child as an active explorer, not a receiver of information. It is, of course, possible to combine these ideas. How about mistakes? Are they good or bad when learning? What do you think? Most people these days seem to think that making mistakes when learning is good. We need to make mistakes in order to learn. If you agree with this, then this is another reason to reject the behaviorist view of learning, at least as it is commonly put into practice in the classroom. When a teacher says, repeat this sentence after me, the teacher is in effect also saying, repeat a correct sentence after me. Don't make mistakes. This focus on doing things correctly is a common aspect of much teacher-centered methodology. Most alternatives to behaviorism, which I will look at in the other videos in this series, See making mistakes as being essential for learning. Thank you very much for watching. In the next video, I will look at the influence of the theory of multiple intelligences. I will also take a bit of a look at humanistic approaches. And also, at the concept of a fixed and growth mindset.